Bill and I thank you for the way you've welcomed us into this community. You know, we finished seminary back when the ink was still drying on the scrolls. <laughs> and so there were some challenges, to say the least, for a clergy couple, especially for the female half of a clergy couple. And through our journey in ministry, uh, there were many times, actually, when I found myself praying, God, could you just help me find a church that would take me? Just let me find a pulpit somewhere. I'll go anywhere. I'll preach anywhere. Except, God, please don't ask me to preach at Montreat. <laughs> That's just too intimidating. And so, leading up to this summer, this Sunday, my mantra has been, it's okay, one, it's okay. It's Upper Anderson. <laughs> um, for our second scripture lesson today, for the hearing of the word, for this lesson, uh, it is from Revelations chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. You have just heard it sung. I'm going to read it for us now. I'm going to read it from the Presbyterian Book of Common Worship. Because it's listed in our Book of Common Worship as a suggested text for special occasions. For funerals, memorial services, times of committal. But it's also listed as a special text for times of crisis, times of natural disaster, or times when there are acts of violence in the nation or in communities, such as yesterday's mass racist shooting that was in Buffalo, New York. It's suggested because in it there are words of promise and there's words of hope. But I wonder if all the times we have read these words or heard them read in such situations, were we able really to hear them in the midst of great grief and loss and pain, perhaps trauma? Maybe that's why it's in the Common Lectionary for the fifth Sunday of Easter on a Sunday morning to be read as the epistle lesson. So let's listen now for a message from God in the words of the vision that was shared with the prophet John. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them, and they will be God's people. God will be with them and will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I'm making all things new. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. May the Lord add blessings to the reading of the word, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Like many of you, we have had friends and family members who have suffered the passing of loved ones in recent months. And some of those friends and family members are sharing their grief 
through social media. <clears throat> and through their candor, their openness, their straightforwardness, we are seeing, we are feeling the rawness of their pain and the depth of the despondency of their loss. One of our friends wrote, posted on, on Facebook, I feel the strange pain of emptiness, the deep ache from the now empty chair, the now empty bed, the places where my beloved was yesterday that remind me every day she's supposed to be here with me. The pain resides in some deep place I cannot find a comfort. There is no escaping it, avoiding it, no way I can ignore it. I can only cover it with a smile, a snappy bow tie, and hope it does not infect you when it leaks from my eyes. Another friend posted, I am realizing that you do not just lose someone once, you lose that person every day, over and over again, for the rest of your life. How is it possible to share the hope and the promise of newness that's in these verses with someone that's in that depth of pain, that much loss? Is it possible? Can they hear that hope? John, the writer of Revelation, knew about loss and pain. Banished, imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos because he refused to acknowledge the Emperor of Rome as a god. He had lost his family, his home, he had lost all connection with the congregations that he had started. He was cut off from the believers that he had mentored. He was their patriarchal leader in the faith. And now he could have no contact with them. He knew about pain and loss. And into that oppressed situation, God sends a vision to him. A vision of a newness coming into the world. And John writes that vision to share, to be sent to these congregants, these members that he's not been able to have any contact with. He shares this vision and he refers to himself as their brother and their companion in tribulation. But I wonder, were they able to hear it? Could they catch a glimpse of this vision, this promise, this hope? We know, looking back, that in that time, there was enough movement and growth in the Christian movement that it was growing in such numbers, in fact, that indeed, coming into reality was a new vision of a heavenly power. A new heaven and a new earth were indeed coming into the first century world of John. But it was difficult. It was hard for the people to see it. Almost 2,000 years later, it's hard for us to see it too, isn't it? We have a hard time seeing it. It seems like the need for a new heaven and a new earth are as much now as ever. There is pain within us, around us. The time when death and mourning will be no more is still not yet. Yes, a new heaven and a new earth would come in handy right now, Lord. I remember when Susan Ryan was serving as director of Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. And I heard her speak to the national response team 
for PDA, for the Presbyterian Church. Now, I had been long, long been intrigued by Susan Ryan and how she approached this daunting task as the director how she got up every day and did not look at the world the way most of us do. We get up, we check the news, we scan real quick to see what, but mostly we look at what's happening in our little corner of the world. And mostly we try to skip over the bad as much as we can to get to the good stuff. But not Susan. She looked at the world the way God looks at the world. She got up every morning and scanned all the news around the globe to see what disasters had happened or were happening anywhere, everywhere. And yet, with this discouraging task, daily task, Susan had an amazing spirit about her. She had an unquenchable hope, an unquenchable hope. A cultural anthropologist by training, she started talking that day to that team about lacrimatories, tear bottles, little bottles that were used for collecting tears. They were used, first used in uh, ancient Rome and ancient Egypt, where people would collect their tears in bottles and they would bury those bottles with the deceased loved one as an act of honor and devotion. In fact, sometimes people were hired, women especially, were hired to walk in the funeral procession and cry tears into the bottles because the perception was that the more tears, the more revered, the more adored, the more respected the deceased was. Then tear bottles showed up again in the 18th century, no, the 19th century, the Victorian age. And this time, in the Victorian age, they were more ornate. And they did not have seals on them, rather they had tops that allowed for the evaporation of the tears because they were not buried with the loved ones then. No, they, they were kept either on a shelf or worn around a neck. And when the tears had evaporated, the time of mourning was understood to be over. They showed up again during the Civil War here in our, in our nation. When women cried their tears into the bottles as their loved ones went off to battle and they wore them with the hope of a safe return. These days, you can order them online. You can use them for your own tears or you can share them with someone as an act, a gift of sympathy. In Psalms, Psalms 56, the psalmist shows us King David, and he's in crisis. He's in crisis at the hands of the Philistines, and he prays a prayer. He prays to God, God, you have known me. You have seen all my tossings. You have kept my tears in a bottle. Your bottle, he says. How wonderful are what you have done. Are not all my tears in your account? Are not all my tears in your record? What a great picture the psalmist gives us of how our Creator cares about us and our tears our sufferings. And if all of our tears are kept in a heavenly tear bank, if all of our trials and tribulations are recorded, how 
precious are they then? How precious they must be to our Creator. But that day, when Susan Ryan was talking, she said, we are God's agents in the world. And as God's agents in the world, it is our calling to carry the tears, to collect the tears on behalf of others, to hold those tears for others. And while we hold them, she says, we share a new vision, a vision of hope coming into the world. We share those in the midst of the pain, in the hurts, in the loss. We share a new vision that wipes away the tears. In Romans 8, the epistle gives us Paul. And Paul is anticipating the birth of new hope. The birth of a nation that has hope. And Paul says, creation has been waiting. Waiting with anticipation. Waiting with longing, eager longing, he says. For God to reveal the Son. And we wait, he says. He says we wait like a woman in labor. We wait with tears. We wait for God to break forth into creation and to make all things new. We wait with hope and anticipation, he says. We wait. We wait through the tears and through the sorrow. We wait. We wait through the struggles and through the times of worry. We wait for the fulfillment of John's vision when God will make all things new. And yet, look at what John says. John says, don't wait. Do not wait. It's happening now. It is now the new heaven and the new earth. Eugene Peterson says that some people, when they talk about heaven and going there, they sound like they're planning a trip to Florida. <laughs> they talk about better weather. They talk about pleasant places to be. They talk about no more sorrows, no more aches and pains. But look at what John says here in the Revelation. He doesn't talk about heaven as a faraway place. No, he talks about how heaven and earth are together. Together they are in the scripture. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then all the way over, in the last book, almost in the last chapter, John tells us, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth breaking forth. Heaven and earth are together. They're together in God's creation. Heaven and earth together make up the work of God. You cannot have one without the other. Now we know that in this earthly realm, our time of shedding tears is not over. There are still more tribulations, more trying times. We don't see an end to tears. We don't see an end to death. We don't see an end to pain, to sadness. And yet, Susan Ryan said that day, Every time, she said, every time there is a great disaster, we see the birth of hope. She said, we see the birth of something new. We see new leaders. We see new community. We see new hope. She said, life we see 
breaks forth in the midst of dying. Hope breaks forth, she says. Glory, glory shines in the midst of suffering. And out of the chaos, out of the chaos, hope emerges. It's not in the future, John is saying to us. It's now. The new heaven and the new earth are breaking in now, John is saying. Look for it. Be ready. The new heaven and the new earth are descending. The heavenly kingdom is breaking in. The home of God is among mortals, and God is making all things new. Even now, even now. Let us pray. God, we ask you, let, collect the tears from our eyes and give us vision. Give us vision to see what you are doing in our lives right now and in our world right now. Amen. Let us pray. God, we come on this day. And to those with heavy hearts, for those who have died in Buffalo, New York, at the hands of a person who just doesn't understand. But yet, oh God, every day in the streets of our nation and around the world, people die hands of others because of hate or anger or fear or misunderstanding. We pray, O oh God, that you will bring us to a time when we will know each other as friends, when our hatred will be done with, our envy our jealousy, our pride will be put aside. And yet we also know that we in some ways contribute to that violence. Either by being too quiet or not acting or not speaking out. Even now the world is at war in many places. We think of the people of Sudan and the people of other nations where so much is going on. And Father, we know that every time another person dies, you grieve and you hurt you feel our loss and our pain. We pray, O oh God, that you would turn the minds of those who think war is an easy answer to power. That you would move us beyond that day of seeking out power. Regardless of what the means or the ends might accomplish. Father, we pray for the million plus people who have died from this virus. We want it to be done with, but we know it is not. And yet there are those among us who go about cavalier as if it doesn't matter anymore, while others die. Help us, O oh God, just in a small way to show compassion. If it means getting a vaccine or wearing a mask or distancing ourselves from one another. Help us turn the tide 
of this infection. But yet, oh God, there's so many things that take our loved ones from us. Things that we have no control over. So in our grief, comfort us. In our pain and loss, console us. In our hurt and despair, give us hope. Hope beyond wisdom and understanding of us mortals. Oh God, we ask you to bless Keith and his family during this time of sabbatical. And be with this congregation as we seek to follow your will and do the things that need to be done in this place to bring hope and care and healing. And now, oh God, hear us as we pray the words that you have taught us as disciples we should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now have the opportunity.